right, to those who have joined us uh, by WLGS Radio or the Internet, I'm Marvin Thomas, and for Pastor John, who is recovering from a neck injury inflicted on him by a hundred-year-old oak tree. Pastor was cutting on it, and it knocked him off the ladder as if to say, hey, buddy, I know you have been here for 30 years, but I've been here for more than a hundred. So buzz off. <laughs> Maybe we should put up a warning tape around that tree. Danger. Angry old oak tree. Or maybe we could make a plaque and say uh, something like, uh, the, this is the angry old oak tree that broke our pastor's neck. <laughs> okay. It's the last week I get to pick on you, so. All right, open your Bibles to Acts, the third chapter. Turn your, into your devices or however you get to the word, get there. <clears throat> well, I think everybody has the book. It's amazing. So we're going to read the first uh, 11 verses here, beginning with the first verse, third chapter. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms for those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. You, so he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking around and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Father, we ask your blessings on the teaching of the word tonight. May you be exalted and glorified and lifted up. And may we come to see you in all of your glory and all of your majesty. In all of your provisions, God, may they come alive in our hearts and souls and minds uh, that we might be the people that you have called us for to be and that your son Jesus has paid for us to be. We thank you and praise you tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Monday morning, last Monday morning, July 10th, 2023, I woke up to this probing, penetrating question in regards to our text today. The question was, why? It was not just my typical who, what, when, where, or why journalistic thought processes. It was God who had my attention. The question was significant for me uh, personally, as it has a lot to do with praying for my firstborn son who has stage four cancer. So I have a vested interest in what God may want to say to us tonight. This message may be for me and not for you, but I pray that you'll be blessed too. I sense the providence of God at work here because I had planned a very different message for tonight. Specifically, the question was directed at the incident of our text. Why did Peter 
and John stop and give attention to a lame beggar at the entrance to the temple. Why did Peter say to the man, look at us? Why did Peter say, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you? What is it that they have, if not money? Peter stops, gains the man's attention, and prays. And God still has my undivided attention and asks me, why did Peter pray? Truthfully, Peter didn't pray. He spoke. He spoke in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. It wasn't a prayer. It was a command. It was a demand for the man to respond to the power and authority of the living Lord Jesus Christ. In just a few short chapters of the book of Acts, we see an amazing array of miraculous activities taking place. So many, in fact, it is easy for our attention to be focused on the miracle rather than God who is accomplishing these miracles. As we read, our mind easily identifies with the imagery that is presented. We hear the rushing mighty wind. We see the divided tongues as of fire. We hear the apostles speak in other languages. We see the perplexed crowds gather. We hear their inquiry, what could this mean? We hear the proclamation of Peter's sermon. We see the response of 5,000 men being birthed into the kingdom of God. We see the infirmities of the lame man setting, begging at the gate of the temple. We hear the declaration of Peter, rise up and walk. We see Peter preaching for the lame man's, reaching for the lame man's hand to lift him up. We see the lame man leap to his feet in wholeness. Not only was he whole, there's two miracles at work there, if you think about it. He was made whole, and he immediately walked. How long did it take you to learn to walk? It wasn't immediate. You had to fall down a few times. Anyway, we see the lame man leap to his feet in wholeness. We hear his exclamations of praises to God as he walks into the temple. We see the people run together in great amazement. We see and hear all of these activities and events taking place as if we were there in person. What is seen and heard easily overshadows what was taking place in the invisible spirit realm prior to and during the events themselves. What is not seen are the teachings and instructions of Jesus that has prepared Peter and John for this momentous momentous occasion. What we have here is one of the first, if not the first, demonstration of the use of the delegated authority of Jesus Christ. Remember what Jesus said, recorded in Matthew 28, 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore. When Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk, He's not just articulating a memorized statement, but is expressing his understanding and belief in the fact that Jesus Christ of Nazareth has all authority in heaven and on earth and is the source of creative power in the material world. Peter is living what Paul later taught the Colossians, uh, recorded in Colossians 1, 15 through 18. I'm reading from the New King James. I have a lot of quotes here from the New Living Translation, so I'll try to point that out. But, but Paul wrote, uh, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things. 
and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. The purpose of the demonstration of the supernatural power over the paralytic condition of the man at the gate was to draw attention to the preeminence of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Jesus has come to the place of preeminence in the lives of the apostles. But the apostles didn't always have such great faith. Listen to this exchange of questions and answers between Jesus and the disciples before Christ was crucified. John, the 14th chapter in the New Living Translation, Jesus is saying, Don't be troubled. You trust God. Now trust in me. There are many rooms in my father's home, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. If this were not so, I would tell you plainly. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know where I am and how to get there. It's interesting to me when I read this that in a few years past, we used to sing a song or hear a song saying, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. Da, 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 da. So if the writer of the of the song had had written picked up the New Living Translation, he would have had to to print it in my father's house. No, nope, that's the other one. I've got a room just down the hallway from Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> I live in an apartment building. I know what it is to go down the hall. <laughs> the first song sounded a whole lot better. I'd rather have a mansion, I think. But how do you get a mansion inside of a mansion? So I don't know. But anyway, Thomas speaks up in true doubting Thomas form. No, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said. We haven't any idea where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known who I am, then you would have known who my Father is. From now on, you know him and have seen him. What is at stake here? is who do the disciples believe that Jesus is? This is crucial to their future and will dictate what their reaction will be to future events in life. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Evidently, he's been hanging out with the doubter too much. He didn't quite get it either. Jesus replied, Philip, don't you even yet know who I am? Even after all the time I have been with you, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking to see him? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe because of what you've seen me do. The miracles have played a pivotal role in mere mortals coming to recognize Jesus as the promised Messiah. All of the New Testament, well, that's not exactly right. Primarily, um, the New Testament, the apostles in their teaching, at least in, in the Gospels, is addressing a Jewish population for the most part. After the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they were in Israel. They were told to go to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. So he's, he's speaking to a Jewish population who has the religious training of the coming Messiah. 
to set things right and to set them free. Jesus continued to say, The truth is, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, and even greater works, because I'm going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it, because the work of, of the Son brings glory to the Father. Yes, ask anything in my name, and I will do it. That's a New Living Translation. There's a lot of um, important concepts that are revealed here in this one verse that's worth looking into, but let's move on. To ask anything in my name of Jesus, in, my, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, is more than just making a request, following a predetermined set of semantics. It is the exercise of delegated authority on behalf of Jesus himself for the glory of the Father. It is the release of the preeminence of Christ to work in a given situation. Jesus continues to reveal a very important aspect of the relationship between believers and God, the Father, His Son, Christ Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. He goes on to say to His disciples in John 14, If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and He will give you another counselor who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads who leads into all truth. The world at large cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. Nothing much has changed. We live in the 21st century and the world is not looking for him, not looking for the return of Jesus and does not recognize Jesus God the Creator, or the, Bo or the Bible for most parts. Looking for Him was more prevalent in the days of the Bible, particularly with the Jews. But you do, because He lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you in just a little while, the world will not see me again, but you will, for I will live again, and you will too. When I'm raised to life again, you will know that I'm in the Father, and you are in me, and I in you. Those who obey my commandments are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them, and I will reveal myself to each one of them. Last Wednesday, I was attempting to make the point that obedience must come from, from the, an attitude of love for our living God, not a duty. When I was in the military, I had, I had duties I, of responsibility, certain ways of behaving that, that they were very very persistent in, in, um, in accomplishing the, a specific way of acting and behaving and doing, marching, talking, whatever, every, every aspect. And uh, all of that, we learn to be dutiful. To do our duty, we continue to learn to be obedient because we didn't want to do any more push-ups or we didn't want to go on KP and do pots and pants or, or we didn't want to run around a platoon of men who is marching and we got a, I got out of step and so I had to double time around all those guys, that whole platoon which is longer than this building in a march as punishment for not getting my left foot down when the, when the leader said, left, right, left. You had to learn your duty and be very precise in, in administering that. But 
that's not what we're talking about. If we p apply that form to, to, if we apply that way of responding to, to the principles of the gospel, it'll be a legalistic affair. But if we are in love with God, if we love the Lord Jesus Christ, then our response is a reciprocation of his love that he has shared with us, that he has, has given to us through the Holy Spirit. Remember last week we mentioned Romans 5.5, 5, that the Holy Spirit would baptize us in the love of God. We are saved by his grace, by his mercy. Even our ability to reciprocate our love to him is a response to what he is doing in us, in our hearts, and in our lives. So I didn't mean to re-preach that, but anyway. After the resurrection and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we see a transformed group of believers. The apostles were fully devoted to following Jesus Christ. They were 100% sold out to him and his cause. Their minds had been fully transformed by the influence of Jesus and his teaching. Their lives were fully engaged with carrying out the instructions and demands of their calling. They were not casual Christians. They were not wishy-washy. They were fully committed to God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ, and the leading and empowering of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Christians, we have to get over our misgivings of the past performances uh, of faith healers and the now faith movement. Their acts are not for us to judge. Our responsibility is rightly discerning the scripture. So, <clears throat> skipping over Peter and John in our text for a moment, we turn to the lame man who Peter later says was 40 years old. He was born with a physical condition which impaired his life to such an extent that he could do nothing but beg for his daily provisions. All his life he had been placed at the temple door to beg. Of course he was overjoyed with the miracle that he received and immediately recognized and gave thanks to God for the new life handed to him. It's no wonder that he entered the temple with Peter and John, walking, leaping, and praising God. We can assume that during all those years of begging at the temple gate, he became a believer in God and, and perhaps was knowledgeable of the promises to the Jewish people of the coming Messiah. Otherwise, if he, if he hadn't turned to God, otherwise he might not have been so quick to praise God. On the other hand, all the people who gathered at the temple were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to them, to him. So much so that Peter quickly springs into action with a thorough explanation of what was happening. Acts 3:11 through to, and 12. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Peter is quick to explain that it is the Lord himself working with them to accomplish great things. It is Jesus Christ of Nazareth who has healed this man. Later in Acts, the 8th chapter, we see Peter rebuke Simon the sorcerer for wanting to purchase the ability of laying on of hands for the wrong reasons. There are many who have tried, who have done things um, in the name of Christ for the wrong reasons. 
Peter and the apostles have no power in and of themselves. Only Jesus can heal or save or deliver. Yet they fully understood that they had been given authority to act on his behalf. Jesus is the healer. Peter draws upon the knowledge that these Jewish men would have of the promises made to Abraham and Israel. For he says... In verse 13, for it is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of all our ancestors, who has brought glory to his servant Jesus by doing this. It is in those words we find the answer to the why question at the beginning of this message. Why did Peter and John stop and give attention to the lame beggar at the entrance to the temple? Why did Peter say to the man, look at us? Why did Peter say, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you? What is it that they have if not money? Peter stops, gains the man's attention, and prays for God's glory to be released, for God's glory to become visible to the onlookers. No, he did not pray. Again, he spoke in a commanding voice to the invader of the temple of God. Not brick and mortar temple, but the believers sitting, waiting for a hand up. As I have given much consideration and thought to the whole principle of prayer for the healing, in particular, of my son who has stage four cancer. The question why becomes, becomes essential in, in to come to a, a scriptural perspective and understanding. My desire, Jeannie's desire, I'm sure Keith's desire and his wife and three children's desire is for a complete healing of his body. And, um, but desire alone is not, is not the criteria, um, as I'm going to explain a little further here. The question for you and I today is the same one Jesus asked of his disciples, recorded in Mark 8:29. Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? Are we fully aware that Jesus is in the Father, and we are in Jesus, and he is in us? If you don't understand that, read the 17th chapter of John, where Jesus makes a very specific prayer for our oneness with him and the Father. Has our minds fully absorbed the knowledge of who he is and who we have become in him? God has called us to the same kind of devotion to Christ and his cause as the apostles we read about in these verses. Not only that, but he has given us everything we need to, to properly represent him in our world. <clears throat> Why did Peter do what he did? I come back to this, and I will try to complete my thought here. He did what he did because he believed that Jesus had authorized him to act on Jesus' behalf for God's glory. He wasn't praying and asking God to do something. He knew what Jesus had said. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. And uh, go therefore. And uh, we read the lyrics in one of our songs, I'm fighting a battle you've already won. No matter what comes my way, I will overcome. I'm fighting a battle you have already won. 
Jesus has won the battle, and, uh, and we are authorized to represent that victory to a lost and dying world. We are authorized to speak on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ that in a way that honors him and would bring glory to him and God the Father and his kingdom. Why did Peter do what he did? Because he believed that Jesus had authorized him to act on Jesus' behalf for his glory. So, back to Keith's situation. My response, the way I have understood this word, is not not to fulfill the desire that I have, that he has, that we have, but to represent God in all of his glory. And uh, sometimes I think, um, so my desire for healing on his behalf can never override God's glory. How many times have we prayed and asked God to do what he has given us to do. The problem is never with God. You will never know why Peter did what he did until you accurately assess what he did. You see, when I have read this, this third chapter, these words so many times, I have thought in terms of... of Peter praying, but it's not a prayer. It is a representation of the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ in a circumstance and a situation that demands uh, action. He acted on what he believed. He believed what Jesus taught. He believed that he had been given the authority to speak on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. He demanded that the lame man do what he could not do. He got the man's attention. He said, look at me. The man thought he was going to get an offering. He said, silver and gold I don't have. I'm just a poor preacher. <laughs> we know how that is. And uh, silver and gold I do not have, but in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He's been sitting there for 40 years, according to Paul, or somebody in Acts. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I should have researched it. For 40 years, he's been in this condition. And, and Peter comes in and says, stand up. Get up. But you see, there was, a, when, we, when we do such things in the knowledge of the authority that's invested in us, that is faith. You don't need faith until you have to act. The, the lame man sitting there, if he, had, if he had the ability to walk, to leap, to jump, and to give praise to God, if he had that, you wouldn't need to assert any form of faith. Peter wouldn't have had to, to speak to his need and speak to him in such a way that God came on the scene and, and backed up, not Peter, but, but the word of Jesus who said, go in my name and do these things. He demanded that the lame man do what he could not do. This is not the only incident where such a thing took place. 
Moses had an un, untenable situation when he and Israel were backed up to the Red Sea and Pharaoh was coming down on him. What am I going to do, Lord? Step out. Cross over that flooding river. Impossible. Unthinkable. Untenable in in our physical reality, in our physical thinking and understanding, in our perspective of our world. But in God's world, in a reality that transcends here and now, a reality that lifts us in our faith to, to a place with the Lord, and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Moses stepped out, the sea parted, Israel went through on dry ground, and the water covered over the enemies who were trying to destroy. An impossible situation. David was faced with an impossible situation The giant had, had talked down the entire Israeli army. Just send one of your guys out here and let's duke it out and see whoever wins gets the prize. But David came on the scene and he heard the words and, he, and his comments to this uncircumcised Philistine is, who are you? to defy the armies of the living God. And he slung a rock and killed the giant. Impossible for a boy with a slingshot. But under the power of God and with but nothing happens in this situation or in Moses' situation or in this situation with, with um, the lame man. Nothing happens until the man of God, the boy of God in David's situation, until action is taken when we step out in opposition to the impossible with the knowledge that God will see us through and bring the victory. If we're fighting a fight that's already been won, then perhaps we ought to rethink I don't have any misgivings about the sentiments of the song, but 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 it does speak to a perspective that, that a deluded perspective, I think, in many cases, as we face the challenges of life, and we need to come to an understanding of that. And when we understand it, we confess our ignorance. That's not a bad word. You know, you don't know what you don't know. How can you know it if you don't know it? So when God reveals something to us, it's our place to say, yes, sir, I agree. I will comply. I will follow your instructions. I will trust you. I will have faith in you. And let's go forward. So... So I'm done. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and praise you, and we're so grateful for your love and mercy and your grace. And now we have the privilege to come boldly before your throne of grace and mercy to ask and receive 
your grace and your mercy in every circumstance of life. May we grow up into such a strong position in our relationship to you that we can be as bold as, as Moses, as David, as Peter and John and the, the apostles and disciples of the New Testament. Lord, do a work in our lives. Reveal those uh, little nuances of, of misunderstanding of our position and whom you have created us, recreated us through your son, Jesus Christ, to be. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying on the cross, for shedding your blood, for the remission of our sins, for bearing the stripes on your back, declaring that because you bore them, we are healed. And we thank you for the gift of eternal life. We praise you and worship you tonight. May you be glorified and exalted and lifted high above all that is distracted many in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for your attention.